Good evening, everyone. My name is Merlin Crossley. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at UNSW. On behalf of the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Engineering, I would like to welcome you all here tonight. I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which this hall is built, the Cadigal people of the Aora Nation, their elders past, present and future. I feel very privileged and proud to stand before you tonight. Privileged because it is a privilege to work in science in a country that has excellent educational and political systems, where discussions like tonight's can take place. I am proud because of the achievements of the faculties of science and engineering here and the contributions they are making to Australia's most pressing problems. The science faculty hosts the Climate Science Research Centre, one of only 13 Australian Research Council centres of excellence awarded in the latest round. The Faculty of Engineering hosts the Centre of Excellence in Photovoltaics and has been a world leader in solar energy for many years now. UNSW is now building a solar industrial research facility, SURF, so further research into producing solar panels can be conducted. The faculties of engineering and science share a third centre with Flinders University, the National Groundwater Centre, which leads research into another topic of environmental importance, our water system. UNSW, together with many other universities in this country, is committed to improving the world through science and engineering. So I particularly wish to welcome my colleague, the Dean of Engineering, Professor Graham Davies, who will be wrapping up the proceedings this evening. We here are all committed to advancing the public understanding of science and technology and engaging in public debate. Our host tonight, Robin Williams, is someone who has perhaps done more than any other single Australian to promote scientific understanding via the media. And I'm delighted we are in the hands of a professional tonight. <laughs> I also welcome Dr. Nikki Williams, the CEO of the New South Wales Mineral Council, who is an articulate and thoughtful leader who can explain to us how a very important industry is approaching the future. I welcome the Honourable Malcolm Turnbull, who really needs no introduction. But let me just say that he is the only politician who has made himself available to speak on this important and contentious topic tonight. I think some of the other politicians may be nervously preoccupied with other things this week. I'm very grateful to Malcolm Turnbull for his many contributions. I also wish to welcome some of our UNSW staff. Dr. Donna Green, the author of Screw Light Bulbs, a book about changing behaviour to cut emissions. And she is an expert on the impacts of climate change. <coughs> Dr. Ian McGill from Engineering, who is an expert on the ETS and energy systems in policy. And Professor Matt England, the co-director of our Climate Science Centre. Matt has just received an Australian Council, Research Council Laureate Fellowship. Only around 11 or 12 or so of these are awarded each year. So this achievement is the scientific equivalent of being selected in the Australian cricket team. And Matt will, I believe, be opening the bowling for the planet tonight. <laughs> Before passing over to Robin, I want to make some simple statements about science. I believe that scientific logic is the fundamental philosophy that has lifted us out of the dark ages and upon which the modern world is built and has <coughs> prospered. I know many scientists, and they are just like other people. Some are lovable, some are hateable, and they all have their own behaviours. But science itself is logical and reliable. It is reliable because it is self-correcting. If errors of logic or of intent occur, they will quickly be corrected. The external referee is reality, and reality cannot be fooled and cannot be talked around. Not all the messages that science delivers are welcome, but it is wrong to attempt to kill the messenger. Our climate scientists at UNSW, working with others across the world, 
predicted the planet was warming, and they have recently released data showing that the last 10 years were indeed the hottest on record. The science is not wrong, and science is not crap. We need to think about whom to listen to here. But I am optimistic. In the past, scientists demonstrated that CFCs were depleting the ozone layer, and the warning was heeded. In the past, scientists showed that lead in petrol was damaging our children and the, the environment, and at some considerable costs, cars were converted so that they could use lead-free petrol. In the past, scientists and doctors, including some excellent Australian researchers, showed that smoking causes lung cancer and that passive smoking was a threat to all. The tobacco companies hit back against this scientific information and their campaign was filthy, but common sense prevailed and the health of the world has been improved by legislative action in many countries. Well, now our world is smoking again. We are burning fossil fuels and polluting the world. We need to work together to change our habits. To do, to do this, we need to harness our strong scientific capacity and engage with the public. Most people are logical and do care. Australia has a fine political system and I expect we are moving forward. We have some good leaders and we have some good future leaders. People who have the courage to make a stand and support policies on the basis of evidence, scientific evidence, rather than on the basis of opinion polls. We have a good education system and an interested population. One of the reasons that we are holding this forum is that we hope that if the right questions are asked, logic will prevail, and ultimately, those opinion polls, which turn many of our leaders into followers, will one day align with scientific reality. So on that note, I welcome you all and thank you all for coming to share in this event. And, I'm a, and, a, and now I am delighted to hand over to our host, Robin Williams of the ABC, who will coordinate this discussion. I should also acknowledge that we are indebted to the ABC itself, who were pioneers in the wonderful modern Q&A format, a version of what we will be adopting tonight. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean. Tonight we're going to debate one of the most significant questions facing Australia, the future of Ben Cousins. <laughs> or so you'd infer. I started doing what's now called the Science Show in 1975 in August. In that first program was a discussion about climate change. As I look back through the archives, I can see in 1971 there was an effective discussion in that program about climate change. The first time it was discussed in the Scientific American, in an editorial, was 1959, and so it goes further and further back. Now, I am just a cynical journalist who does not want to keep repeating stories. In fact, if Elvis were discovered tomorrow, after 24 hours, I would think, oh no, not that bloody story again. And so it's the same with things like climate. I would report it as I would, being a financial journalist, on the price of the euro. Here's an objective value as posted somewhere with some authority. But even the price of the euro changes. It's flexible, it's different tomorrow, and is arguable. And so the aspect of science, which the Academy of Science itself talked about today, has become complex and maybe slightly more difficult to understand. And it's no coincidence that on this very afternoon at 3 o'clock, the Academy published this document, which took them 1,500 hours, of careful deliberation to get through to its present stage, the science of climate change, questions and answers. And just to give you a flavor of the kind of things they have come to, Professor Will Steffen, the Executive Director of the Climate Institute at the ANU said, this document produced by the most authoritative scientific <coughs> body in Australia is a welcome and important contribution to the public discourse on climate change. The document acknowledges the significant uncertainties that surround our knowledge about how climate change will continue to unfold this century and beyond. But it makes absolutely clear that we know two critical aspects of climate change. 
with a very high degree of certainty. One, climate change is indeed real and already happening, and two, human emissions of greenhouse gases are the primary cause. This knowledge is a compelling and incontrovertible basis on which to take policy action. Secondly, Professor Neville Nichols, ARC Professorial Fellow, School of Geography and Environmental Science at Monash says, 2010 is becoming known as the year of the heat wave, with 17 countries having set new records of hot temperatures. This year, 2010, has also broken <coughs> the record for the number of countries setting new record hot temperatures. The previous record of 14 countries was set only three years ago in 2007. And while one swallow does not make a summer, nor one fine day, a ratio of 17 new hot records to only a single new hot cold record is pretty convincing evidence that the world is warming. So this accessible summary of climate science prepared by Australia's peak scientific body is timely and welcome. Tonight we'll hear brief statements from each of the people on the panel, starting at the same point, Matthew. And then I will read out some of the questions that have already been sent in as per Tony Jones and Q&A. And then I'll whip down to the audience with a colleague and it'll be a free-for-all Q&A until quite late. Well, until drinks. So, Matthew, first, it your own line in this. Someone in this did. Stay there if you like. Or, no, no, come up here. Thanks, Robin. I'm mic'd up here so I can stand here. I'm sorry to, yeah, to do this mind. to the audience late. Well, not that late on a Monday night, but nonetheless, you maybe didn't come to see PowerPoint shows and slides, but I can't help myself. I'm a scientist. I'm going to start off with an animation uh, of the last 250 years of human emissions of carbon dioxide. And um, if this will play, uh, the reason I'm doing this is to bring to the audience this history of, of where we've come from over the last 250 years. Uh, it kicks in and you'll see the Industrial Re Revolution beginning in the United Kingdom. It's quite amazing to see once it clicks over. This is not running nearly as quickly as it should. <laughs> That's the demo god. So if I go to five minutes, please excuse me, it's the animation's fault. Uh, so the Industrial Revolution began in the United Kingdom and very quickly spread to mainland continental Europe. Brilliant technologists, Merlin referenced these folks who are uh, devising new ways of, of uh, powering energy and, and, and bringing electricity to the world. Back then, 250 years ago, these were technologies that were very welcomed and brought humanity out of the dark ages. Unfortunately for us today, they were very carbon intensive. They've been taken up on a planetary scale. Uh, this spreads across into the United States and across into mainland Europe. It is really, it should have been over by now because it's uh, trucking along too slowly. I'll kick forward a bit just to um, spare the suspense. By, by the middle of the 20th century, all of the industrialized and developing nations were using carbon technology for transport, electricity, and so on. And you can see that where we are today, at the end of the 20th century, we've pretty much got a situation where all of the major continents, all of the developed and the developing nations have major carbon imprints into the atmosphere. And, and this is a situation that has to change, as I'll show in my remaining two minutes. So, onto the PowerPoint. And again, just excuse me, five or so graphs. So, so this animation that dragged along a bit too slowly tracked through the last 250 years. And you can see here, uh, the progress is an exponential curve. This is our global emissions of fossil fuels. And you can see brilliant technology started us on this track. We must celebrate those great scientists of the 18th century, but it's taken us uh, into the 21st century with emissions that need to be curbed drastically. In 1992, I was really happy to hear Robin Hark back to the 1970s. This is well known. Uh, Jimmy Carter was handed a very thorough report on the effect of carbon emissions on the planet, and he was told back in 1979, the time for action is now. Our opportunity to address this problem is rapidly passing. In those uh, 15 or so years later, Every major nation had signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC there in 1992. And since that time, and this Article 2 of that convention stated very clearly that nations will do whatever they can to avoid dangerous interference with the climate system. And since that time of, of that treaty being ratified, 
emissions have grown by 40% globally. So this is very disappointing to the science community. We saw an acknowledgement by all nations of the planet uh, close to 20 years ago to address this problem in significant ways. And since this time, we've only grown our emissions by a phenomenal amount. We are very lucky. Only half of what we, we emit remains in the atmosphere. A good portion ends up in the ocean and also in the terrestrial biosphere. But this free uptake from the oceans and the land system mm -hmm. uh, cannot be relied on to be stable forever. Uh, we know that if we change the climate enough, for example, the Amazon basin may uh, even die back in extreme scenarios, and that massive sink of carbon into the, into the forest there could become a source. So we can't rely on this as a status quo, but at the moment it's important to say um, that about half of our emissions remain in the atmosphere. And, but this is enough to be changing the climate system. Here is uh, the, the graph that a climate scientist would look at the past 150 years of the instrumental record showing this gradual progressive warming. The individual dots are year to year uh, values. Anything you see above the blue curve uh, significantly is an El Nino year, which characterizes the planet with a a, a, a transient single year of, of anomalous warmth, but by and large, the kind of uh, curves that a climate scientist look at, um, not a family first minister who might zoom into the last 10 years erroneously, he really should take climate physics 101, but a climate scientist would look at the last 20, 30, 50 years, and, and this trend is obviously, as Will Steffen's quote just read by Robin reflects, one of unambiguous warming. Other things are changing, and I'll just quickly point out, this is just sea level, and the point of this graph is to make a defense of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We often hear this is an alarmist political organization, yada, yada, yada. This is so far from the truth. This is many thousands of climate scientists actively debating and arguing the science. And only the very tried and tested and, 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 and the science that has, has stood the test of time percolates through to these 1,000-page reports, line by line reviewed. And yet, the projection for sea level rise made uh, some years ago for the, for the IPCC into the future has underestimated sea level rise. And this is just one of many indicators that is changing faster than the IPCC has projected. So at the moment, the science community is looking at the last few reports and actually thinking, uh, if anything, some of the rates of change of climate change have been underestimated. My last graph before I hand to the next speaker, and apologies for overindulging my three minutes, is just a look into the future. There's two different worlds here. The, very, the, the red curve could be called the George Bush scenario, or I could name other politicians, but it is, it is the scenario of absolutely no action on, on carbon emissions. It's saying they're OK, let's keep burning them without any regard for the concentration in the atmosphere. And the lower curve shows you the warming range that you will get to um, if we're very lucky, only about 3.5 degrees global average warming, up to about 7. There was a survey that um, Malcolm presumably did recently where policymakers were asked, what level of warming do you think is safe? Many politicians, I'm, I'm sure Malcolm didn't, is not in this camp, thought that four, five, six degrees of global warming would be fine. To put this in context, that would certainly melt the Greenland ice sheet and it would certainly melt the West Antarctic ice sheet. And this is many meters, about 10 meters of sea level rise over the next several centuries. It's heat waves, it's a whole almost apocalyptic sounding scenario to go to those high levels. The, the range of, of the, world, the world in the blue curve where you take dramatic action will still be one of change, but it will be one of much less significant change than taking no action at all. Thank you. <clears throat> and Mickey Williams. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, I don't make a habit of disagreeing with distinguished deans, but I, I, I must say, as a political scientist, I don't have the same degree of confidence in the excellence of Australia's political system at the moment. And I'm sure there are many of you in this audience that might agree. I want to make six points. And the first one uh, is very obvious to, to, uh, to those of us in the industry, but uh, sometimes I, I confront quite a degree of surprise from the community. Um, the mining industry in Australia sees climate change as very real, as dangerous. It is not science fiction. Uh, CO2, man-made CO2, is a major problem, and obviously the burning of fossil fuels, particularly coal, is a very serious component of that. Uh, our industry wants to be part of the solution. 
My second point uh, is to be very clear that uh, Australia and indeed the world needs a price on carbon. We will not be able to drive uh, efficiency in energy use or lower our consumption of energy without a price on carbon. Climate change policy uh, in Australia, uh, on all sides of politics, uh, from my, my view, is at the least um, disappointing, at the worst diabolical, and uh, we'll be exploring uh, the politics of, of the so-called uh, climate change policies this evening. I think uh, it is completely fallacious to suggest that there is no consensus in Australia about climate change action. There is a very clear view from the Australian community that action on climate change needs to be taken. What isn't clear is what action, how and when, and what the costs of that action will be. There has been a complete refusal of all sides of politics to really discuss those different options and what that means for us individually and collectively. And that has been a tremendous failure and it has seen the triumph of politics <coughs> over policy. And I think that that is uh, somewhere that I would like to see uh, the debate move in a completely different direction from the one that's uh, currently being taken. If we look at the Rudd government's carbon pollution reduction scheme, I want to make a very clear point. Now, Mr Turnbull was uh, very significant in uh, the negotiation around that scheme, with terrible consequences for him and, and the party. But the mining industry did oppose that particular scheme. We're not opposed to an emissions trading scheme. We did oppose that scheme for the simple, or not for the, for the simple reason, but for one important reason. That scheme would have raised $120 billion in taxes from industry, but 80 billion of that 120 billion would have gone back to households and mo motorists to anesthetize us from the actual pain of taking action on climate change. Unless we feel, each of us individually, the cost of changing our behavior, we won't change our behavior. And I think that climate change policy actually has to create a signal to each of us, a meaningful signal, uh, for, uh, for us to, to change our approach to energy use. The problem is not the big polluters, as if there's this group of entities over there who have to be punished and do something. Of course, the big polluters are big polluters because they're producing goods and services that each one of us consumes and that this country exports around the world. Unless we are prepared to change our behavior, we can't change that dynamic. So that notion about what it means for us individually is an important part of the debate that we simply have not had yet here in Australia. Finally, I think the world needs solutions and technology uh, is the answer. It is not the triumph of politics over policy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming uh, out on a, uh, to hear a Q&A on an issue that's uh, largely gone missing in this election campaign, as Merlin noted. Um, I'm an academic in the School of Electrical Engineering and Telecommunications. But the area I work on is largely integrating sustainable energy technologies into the Australian national electricity industry. But I also work with colleagues across the university with a centre called the Centre for Energy and Environmental Markets, formerly a research centre established between the faculties of engineering and what is now the Australian School of Business, but also working with colleagues in arts and social sciences, law, and the Faculty of Science, particularly the Institute for Environmental Studies. Um, our focus is largely on the electricity industry and on climate change. So the electricity industry, which is keeping the lights on in here, as we speak, and environmental markets and policies to basically transform that industry in a way that the lights stay on, uh, we can still afford it, uh, but that we basically move to clean energy and very low emissions. As sort of Matt's flag, and, and I think it's been picked up, 
our challenge is not sort of fiddling at the edges of the electricity industry. It's actually a very large-scale transformation that's required. And there's sort of two key aspects. One of that is the technologies. It just takes time to bring energy technologies in and build the infrastructure. And we really are on the edge of the amount of time we have to radically transform our electricity industry and economy more widely just within a set of engineering and sort of business constraints. Uh, the other part of the challenge, and I think Nikki sort of really picked this up, is that uh, the other key part of the change is uh, in ourselves. And uh, we continue to find new ways to use energy. It gives us uh, wonderful benefits. And uh, it's probably fair to say we have a bit of a dependency problem uh, that needs to be addressed. Now, first the good news. Um, in 2008 and in 2009, around the world, we invested more in renewable energy uh, generation capacity than we did in non-renewable capacity. And in the EU and the United States last year, we actually built more renewable capacity than fossil fuel capacity. Elsewhere in the world, uh, it's a very different story. Now the bad news, apart from that uh, <laughs> walkie-talkie back there, and uh, that is that it's not nearly enough. Global emissions did drop last year, and they also dropped in Australia, uh, but it sort of really took a global financial crisis uh, to do that, and that doesn't seem to be a very sustainable uh, low emission policy framework. So we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, to sort of drive that transformation. So emissions trading. Um, well, the first point, of course, is that it's a means, not an end. Uh, it succeeds or fails on its ability to be part of driving our energy uh, systems and our behaviour to reduce emissions. Um, if we put a price on carbon and nothing changes, well, it's just a money go round. So that's what our emissions trading has to do. Now, the good news is it's a highly promising policy approach. Uh, it looks to be uh, economically efficient. It puts a cap on emissions and it puts a price tag on pollution. And so it assigns a responsibility for those who pollute to pay for that, or as Nikki made the point, to pass that on to the end customers to take that responsibility on uh, when they use energy. Uh, now, the bad news. Uh, it's by no means the only policy that we need. It's uh, why would we think a price signal could drive all of the change uh, that we need to see so even if we do get emissions trading in, uh, our work's just begun on all of those other policies that we're going to need. The other bad news, of course, is that it's proving fairly hard to pass uh, emissions trading schemes. And that's uh, not just here in Australia, of course, it's also the United States, it's also a number of other countries where we have seen emissions trading schemes come through, most recently, of course, last month in New Zealand. It's fair to say that the schemes that have passed through are at best fairly modest successes, as it stands. Now, perhaps there are basis uh, for moving forward, but it's been very challenging to implement emissions trading schemes, but to implement really effective ones is proving harder again. So, uh, I guess two questions which I sort of really have in mind, and uh, hopefully we can make some progress on them tonight. One question is, is the problem with emissions trading? Is it the wrong policy approach? Or is the problem actually that we're just finding this problem too hard overall? It's not emissions trading, it's the nature of the change uh, that we have to drive. So that's the analysis and understanding. And then the second question, of course, is uh, what on earth are we going to do about it, uh, given the challenges that we face? So hopefully we can make some progress on that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ian. Malcolm Turnbull, MP. Thank you. As Matthew England described, we are at present conducting a massive and unprecedented science experiment with our own planet, the consequences of which we know, if that experiment continues, will be truly catastrophic. There is, of course, a great deal of uncertainty as to what those consequences will be. But again, as you've seen from the uh, slide that Matt showed, the disconcerting reality is 
that when you compare the range of forecasts made by the IPCC, for example in 2001, with the physical record since that date, the physical record is trending at the higher end, the higher level of those estimates. So we should never imagine that just because there is uncertainty associated with the forecasts or the estimates, be it of temperature, be it of uh, sea temperature, be it of atmospheric temperature, be it of sea levels, we should never imagine that just because there's uncertainty associated with those, that the final result will err or trend to the lower end of those estimates. The uncertainty cuts both ways. And so far, what little we know, given the relatively short physical record since 2001, what we know is that it's trending towards the higher level. The fact is that if we are to achieve the massive cuts in carbon emissions <clears throat> by mid-century that the science tells us we need to make, we will need to reach a point where all or almost all of the world's stationary energy comes from zero emission sources. That is a massive technological transformation. And we need to get started now. We cannot keep on postponing action. Why should we put a price on carbon? Well, it's very simple. That is the most cost-effective way of cutting your emissions. I entirely agree that an ETS is not an end in itself. It's just a piece of economic plumbing. But I believe, as a liberal, as John Howard believed, as a liberal, that the most effective way to cut emissions is to harness the power of the market, to put a price on those carbon emissions, the currently untaxed, unpriced, negative externality of those carbon emissions, and then millions of people all around the world will use their own ingenuity and come up with technologies, devices, ideas, techniques that will cut emissions. Governments picking winners is always, technological winners, is always a fraught business. Always a fraught business. Far better for the government to set the rules, set the rules of the market, and then let the market go to work. Why has the emissions trading scheme putting a price on carbon been politically contentious? Simply because Pete, there are vested interests who do not want to see their cost of doing business increased. And it is very easy to say this is just a way of putting up electricity prices. Nikki made one criticism which I must take issue with her about an ETS. And she objected to the fact that much of the revenue from an, the emissions trading scheme from the sale of permits would be recycled back to households. With respect, Nikki, that is the whole point. The whole idea of an emissions trading scheme is not to raise additional net revenue for government, but simply to change relative prices. What we have is a negative externality, the emission of carbon dioxide, which is currently unpriced. It's a form of pollution for which, which, is, which you're allowed to conduct for free. We put a price on that via a cap and trade system, or you could do it via a carbon tax, I grant you and that generates revenue for government, then that is returned to households so that households are no worse off with money in their pocket, but the cost of electricity is still higher. They still have an incentive to use energy more efficiently. Finally, I just make one note. I hope we have a discussion about this. It'll be a first in Australia. We should really discuss the efficacy of energy efficiency. Uh, one of the uh, things that is, I heard an economist clap then, that's good. One of the great, one of the fathers of modern economics is Will, William Stanley Jevons, who worked for a while in the, as, as an as, in the assay office here in Sydney. And his uh, book on the coal question in the 1850s put the finger on a key problem with energy efficiency, which is that as you get more output from a given amount of energy, he was talking about tons of coal, the cost of that energy becomes less because what you can get in terms of output from that source of energy, burning coal for example, uh, is greater. That provides a natural incentive for people to use more energy. This rebound effect is a very big issue 
in energy policy. We haven't talked about it enough. And it underlines the point that while we can do as McKinsey has, does and has done and point to the low-hanging fruit, energy efficiency, you know, uh, roof insulation, although that's less popular nowadays after the catastrophic program uh, of the government, but the, the fact is that if you want to get those emission levels down, there is no substitute for moving to a point where most, if not all, of our stationary energy comes from zero emission sources. There's no substitute for that. We can duck and weave, but we cannot dodge that inevitable conclusion, melancholy and challenging though it may be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Donna Green, author of Screw Light Bulbs. Thank you, Robin. Um, can I get this mic on? Can you Sorry. hear me? Sorry. Okay. Um, it was my birthday recently. Uh, but that's not why the cake is here. And this wasn't scripted, Malcolm. And don't worry, it's not going towards your face. <laughs> <laughs> well, not by me, anyway. Um, if you want a slice of cake, is this what you do? This bit, you probably do do that bit. But I bet you don't do this bit. Doing that is crazy. Why would you waste such an important resource? That is, of course, cake. Well, it's a good question. But that's exactly what Australia is doing every day, just not with cake. Every time you turn on a light, the electricity, use, use, sorry, the electricity you're using comes from burning coal. But our old-fashioned system of generating this electricity wastes a large proportion of the energy in the coal. In fact, it wastes about the same proportion as that cake I just threw away. Now, this wouldn't annoy me as much if Australians weren't one of the highest greenhouse gas emitters per person on the planet, but we are or if there wasn't another way to provide energy services, like hot showers and cold beer, but there is. It's well past time for our political leaders to realize the Australian public isn't stupid. A federal government report released in 2004, Securing Australia's Energy Future, details just how much money we waste through energy inefficiency every year. It's close to a billion dollars. It's actually $975 million. I can't quote from our revised energy white paper, which I'd love you to go out and read, because it was due for public release last year, but our current government is too scared to release it. The fastest way to go to a low carbon economy is to put a price on carbon. This will reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases through energy efficiency practices and the growth of clean energy industries. Given the rorting of the old CPRS, I think the simplest and most efficient way of doing that is with a carbon tax. Everyone knows that wasting an important non-renewable resource, like cake, is a pretty stupid idea. How long will it take for our political leaders to make the real energy policy change? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chucking away that lump of cake reminds me of uh, piece in the New Scientist last week, they had an article with evidence that showed that with the food thrown away in America, which amounts to about 170 billion bucks worth a year, is equivalent, if you turned it around to get oil out of it, to all the offshore drilling that goes on off the coast of North America. You know, there are certain ways that you can get one to work on the other. This is the part where I actually try to do a Tony Jones and read out a number of questions that have come in from, well, the university and generally outside, and we'll have them caught by various members of the panel. Borislav from Kogora, he says, and maybe Matt can start with this, I've given him a microphone so he's not completely isolated. Considering the Montreal Protocol, which has just had a birthday, and its success, could you please comment on why the same success does not translate to current climate changes. He goes on, can any parallels be drawn, and if so, how relevant are they to current challenges? And if you could also comment on economic and social factors involved. One line through that would be fine. <laughs> uh, the, the question relates to chlorofluorocarbons. A lot of folks don't understand the difference, but basically the CFCs were destroying the stratospheric ozone, and uh, we were very lucky in that situation because the, the technologists uh, were given an incentive, they knew the writing was on the, on the wall, that we had to abandon CFCs, they discovered 
hydrofluorofluorocarbons that basically uh, could replace chlorofluorocarbon. So we had a bit of luck there, and also some good technology. I think what's different here is that um, uh, the, the, the degree of carbon in our economy, if you like, is much more significant than the degree of CFCs we, have, we had in our economy. So it's a much bigger problem. Uh, I would argue many of the solutions are out there, but there's not just one solution. That's the other thing the CFC problem had going with, for it. There was one solution to one problem, and it was solved. Yeah, but they came together in Montreal, whereas they did not come together in Copenhagen. Well, I'd say they came together back in the UNF, the, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. I guess a lot of folks would say UN Framework Conventions don't mean much, not much more than the paper they're written on, but this is certainly an example where countries have signed on to something that's very, very abstract. Let's not, interfere the plan let's not interfere with the planet's climate system. Um, this is not a very tangible goal. It's not like saying, let's no longer uh, you know, run nuclear weapons into, a, into a, a certain nation. I mean, it's a very abstract uh, uh, convention to say, let's not interfere with the climate system at dangerous levels. And since this time, I would argue the scientists have been saying, well, what is dangerous? And, you know, because we want to put numbers on things. But the fact is, I think the UNFCCC was the equivalent of, of Montreal for the carbon problem. It's just that governments find this problem hard to solve. Thank you. Craig Matraville, how much money is being spent on carbon capture and storage technology as opposed to renewables research and infrastructure spending? Maybe, Nikki, do you know those? I'm not certain globally what the, what the figures are, but it's, it's, it's many, many billions of dollars. I mean, there are some 40-plus uh, projects going on around the world uh, from you know, North America, Europe, um, Algeria, uh, and there are 14 projects going on here in Australia. Uh, in terms of the Australian industry and Australian government and scientific uh, commitments, we're talking uh, somewhere between three and five billion dollars at the moment uh, in terms of, of these uh, projects. And they're very different sorts of projects. So, some of them relate to carbon capture and storage. Others relate to combustion technologies and how you retrofit those combustion technologies to existing power plants. And this is an area that I think is, uh, requires enormous at attention. There are many trillions of dollars of generating fleet, uh, electricity generating fleet around the world with a useful life of 30 or 40 years. So if you're talking about how you reduce emissions, clearly technologies which can be retrofitted to those power stations are going to be vital, going to play a vital role in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years in terms of reducing those emissions. So it's, it's a large program, but uh, it is not as significant as the investments that have been made by some countries in uh, the renewable sector. Uh, so countries like Germany, for example, have been spending 6 billion euros a year uh, uh, supporting uh, their solar programs, solar energy programs, um, large commitments in Spain, etc. So there, we, the, the, um, the sort of, those uh, bankers who are involved in the financing around these projects um, suggest that carbon capture and storage and low emission coal technologies have not so far received the amount of support that other renewable, uh, advanced renewable technologies have so far received. Malcolm. Yeah, just to add, add to that, I think um, carbon capture and storage is, which is the business of extracting the carbon dioxide from the flue gases uh, of a power station from burning coal or uh, extracting it as part of the gasification process in a more advanced power station and then compressing it and pumping it under the ground is really uh, assumed by just about everybody in the energy business and the climate change business as being the technology that will be the hope of the side. If you look at the work of the, um, um, you know, the, or any of the energy think tanks, you'll see that. Now, the troubling thing about this, and when I was your environment minister, I did spend a lot of your money on clean coal, I confess, but the, the thing that is most troubling about it is that there is not one industrial scale example of a power station operating with, with carbon capture and storage. Uh, Every element of the process is technically possible, so it's well understood. But it's becoming disturbingly um, apparent, I think, to many people in the industry 
that the actual cost of doing it is really enormous, simply because of the physicality of the whole process. I'm happy to go into that in more detail. I'm, uh, I and a lot of other people who used to be strong advocates of carbon capture and storage are really now starting to question whether, uh, even if it's technically feasible, it is going to ever be economically competitive with other uh, zero, uh, eff effectively zero emission forms of uh, generating energy. Ian, and then I'll come to Donna with a new question. Mm -hmm. um, Feel free. I've got the status of CCS Project's interim report, which is the Australian arm of the international um, CCS. The figures there are over 26 billion US worldwide in proposed government support. That sounds quite major to me. Um, also, I'd just like to point out that they're actually, and this is again coming from this body, they're asking for a carbon price, or sorry, they would need a carbon price of between 60 and $112 to make CCS worthwhile. And they were actually asking the consumer to pay for that. That was one of the suggestions. Now, that sounds suspiciously like a carbon tax to me. If we're going to have a carbon tax, shouldn't we have a carbon tax that actually reduces emissions rather than actually just buries something under the ground? Mm -hmm. It makes no sense to me. On top of that, at the moment, we've got the only, and this is one of the sites that is pointed to in Australia as a CCS site, Hazelwood, where they're actually tri trialling technologies. They haven't managed to link capture carbon and sequestration, but what they're actually doing, which costs $10 million at Hazelwood, it's currently capturing 25 tonnes of carbon dioxide. Now, that's nothing. I mean, the amount we would need to capture over and over every year consistently and keep underground forever is measured in billions of tons. We're not even close. We know this technology is 20, 30 years away. I'm delighted that hopefully Malcolm influenced his leader in reducing the amount of Australian taxpayers' dollars that will go into CCS technology if Tony Abbott won the election, because it seems like a real white elephant to me, and I don't think I'm alone. Ian Ewer, I guess. <laughs> uh, look, I think uh, we're making good progress on the technologies. There's a lot of work being done here at this university as, else, as elsewhere. But I think Malcolm makes a very good point, which is that it's not enough that we can make it work. It actually has to compete because mm. we have a range of options out there. And we, uh, it's a really important question. We have to find out about carbon capture and storage uh, as quickly as possible because if it is problematic or it's uncompetitive, we've got a really serious problem for our current strategy of uh, continuing to build the coal industry on the basis that this technology uh, will arrive. Now, Craig's question picked up the issue of spending in renewables and the point with CCS is we are actually only spending modest amounts on it. One of the key reasons is industry's not sure what, it, what to spend the money on because the technology, we just haven't uh, really worked out how good and which of the options are best. For renewables, on the other hand, there's a wide range and a growing range of proven technologies that you can effectively buy off the shelf. So what we're actually doing is actually spending far more on renewables right now than we are on CCS because it's the proven versus the unproven. But I'd really like to hear Nikki's view on this. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to move on. Elisa from New College. As an Australian, you can incorporate your answer to the next question. As an Australian youth, I want to know why an ETS or other form of policy is considered optional and what is a reasonable time frame for such a policy to take effect and substantially reduce carbon emissions? Donna. I wasn't expecting that. Um, okay, I'm going to incorporate my answer into a town hall meeting where I saw Malcolm present um, just the other day on the Beyond Zero report. And also, if um, some of you realised that Germany actually said it would go 100% renewable by 2050. It's ahead of its target already. It's at 16% renewable technology, sorry, renewable energy. So the concerns that people have about actually waiting for government to do something for the general public, like bringing in ETS, I think at this, the moment we, we've just lost our way completely. I mean, Australian youth should be out there demonstrating and throwing rocks because the politicians aren't listening to us, unfortunately. We have to find a new way to make the politicians listen to us because they're going to only act when we force them to act. One of the wonderful things about youth, and I'm glad I'm not in that um, bracket anymore, is that they have an incredible ability to use new forms of protest, for example, new social media networking techniques to actually get their voices heard. 
So I think now is the time really to um, stand behind advocates of 100% renewables on top of demand side management and energy efficiency in Australia. And um, I'd like to actually support Malcolm Turnbull's push for that, as I heard him support BZD report a couple of nights ago. Good. That's it. Mm. <laughs> now the next question is from Daniel in Parramatta, and it's actually for Malcolm Turnbull. And I'm simply reading what's in front of me. <laughs> when, will, when will the Liberal Party under Tony Abbott stop sending out misinformation and scare campaigns about climate change and the ETS and start working together with Labour to come up with a suitable, effective and ambitious ETS based on best available science and market and geographic opportunities in renewable energy? Malcolm. Well, <clears throat> uh, just for the record, I'd... I'd have to uh, disagree with Daniel that uh, Tony Abbott is sending out misinformation and scare campaigns, but he certainly, doesn't, he certainly doesn't agree with an emissions trading scheme, and I don't think there is any prospect of him working with Labor to come up with a suitable, effective or ambitious ETS based on the best available science, etc. I mean, he's been quite clear. Tony has said that he does not believe there should be a price on carbon. It's, uh, he's, a, he's an old friend of mine, but it's a point, a fundamental point, on which we differ. Um, I comfort myself that uh, while my views are perhaps not as politically fashionable as they used to be, at least they're shared by uh, every economist I know, so that's something. <laughs> Nikki, would you like to comment on that? <laughs> okay, well, the second part of Daniel's question, for you, Nikki, what kind of support and incentives does the mining industry need in order to transition to a low-carbon, low-impact system of operation that is energy, water, and material efficient and uses closed-loop production systems? Well, the industry itself um, is not... Um, it's not the largest user of energy in, in, in the Australian economy or, or, or in any economy. Uh, so clearly, as, as with any business, it's got to go through the usual range of, of looking at its cost inputs and, and seeing how it can reduce them. And that's a standard operating procedure for most, uh, for most businesses. So it's, the, the cost of electricity is significant, of course, to run a mining operation, but that isn't um, the key driver of, of costs in the mining sector. In terms of water use and uh, other efficiencies, uh, what isn't uh, well understood uh, in the Australian public is that the mining sector consumes 1.4% of Australia's uh, water resources. Uh, in many instances, mines consume 70% 70, 70 of their water consumption is not potable. In other words, it's uh, recycling effluent and things of this type. There's a lot of water sharing that goes on between mines, this sort of thing. So there is, um, there are high levels of efficiency within the mining industry. I think um, more, more importantly is how do we, uh, as an economy and globally, how do we transition to uh, low emission sources of energy? And there, when we're talking about uh, the suite of solutions that are, are necessary, all, all of them uh, technical and all of them driven by the cost, basically, uh, the price on carbon, um, carbon capture and storage is a key part of that. Uh, the fact that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Al Gore and every other uh, reputable uh, entity and individual uh, says that CCS has to play a key role as we transition from a fossil-based economy to a non-fossil-based economy um, means that we have to make investments now if we're actually going to slow our trajectory. What you may not understand is that the International Energy Agency says that global um, electricity consumption energy demand is going to double between now and 2030. And 90% of, uh, of the growth in uh, energy, uh, sorry, in greenhouse gas emissions is going to come from non-OECD uh, Asia, and 70% of that 90% is China and India alone. So you've got huge, half the world uh, industrialising, uh, with half of their populations not even having access to a single humble electric light bulb. So clearly as those uh, societies 
seek to industrialise and seek to um, uh, have something equating to a, a basic and decent standard of living, we're going to see this tremendous trajectory of, of coal use and electricity use and we're going to see uh, an enormous uh, increase in greenhouse gases. The, um, I think it's the IPCC, says 55% um, increase in greenhouse gases between now and 2030. What they also say is that uh, by 2050, uh, there will be an increase in greenhouse gas emissions of 130% unless we deploy carbon capture and storage, and that if we don't deploy carbon capture and storage, the cost of halving our emissions will be 70% more expensive than any other option. So it is a key part of uh, how we move forward. And I think uh, for us as a society, it's how do we actually bring on these technologies, and that's one of them, of and renewables are another part of it. How do we bring those on so we actually transition by around 2050, I guess, to a, a, a low or, or, or zero fossil fuel based economy. You cannot do that overnight without turning out the lights. Donna, do you want to get your cake out again? Yeah. <laughs> can I? Yeah, uh, very briefly. Uh, you actually can. China is currently planning 100 gigawatts of wind power by 2020. Mm. Now that's massive. Absolutely. That's the Three Gorges Dam size in wind power. These are serious technologies you can't say anymore that renewables can't do the job. There's base low power in solar, solar thermal. Spain is racing ahead putting these plants in. What we need to do is get the cake out of the bin and wave it around when anyone says, oh, what's going to happen with energy? We can see the graphs going up to the right over the next 50 years. We need to drive those graphs back down. We don't need to assume we have to have business as usual growth in energy consumption. We can employ DSM, demand side management. We can employ energy efficiency techniques to get our consumption of energy down and to get the services we need. On top of that, we can put on renewables. And we know they're actually now starting to kick in in a serious way. So we can avoid doing the dangerous stuff. We can avoid doing the let's keep building coal till we're really sure stuff. Thanks. Great, Chris. Malcolm. Yeah, look, I just, the, the, the discussion about Clean coal really underlines a, a key point, which is that um, we really shouldn't be trying to pick technological winners. Um, when I first started looking at clean coal seriously, I guess it would have been about five years ago, I was told by pretty smart people at the CSIRO that they thought the cost would be about $30 a tonne. There is nobody will will predict a cost of clean coal in operation, and of course it's a speculation because there is no, nothing really to match it against, no one will predict a cost of less than $100 a tonne nowadays. You know, the, the, the reality is a lot of these assumptions about the role of clean coal have been premised on it being much more affordable than it currently appears to be. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I hope the technology becomes widely available and is really, really cheap, that would be great. But why don't we just set a price, set a cap on emissions, let the market work out a price, and then people can find out which techno technologies are going to be right. And, you know, we could all write down what we think will be the leading technology here tonight, and we'll probably, every single one of us will be wrong, you know? That's the genius of markets. You, en you engage the ingenuity of so many different people. While you're up, Malcolm, uh, I have a question from William St. Peter. <coughs> he says, the notion of an ETS, particularly for conservatives, seems like an economic bulwark for a country whose contribution to global warming is otherwise slim. Can Mr. Turnbull outline, with the help of those around him, on the panel, I presume, that shifting towards a national reductions target will have practical benefits for job seekers and the economy? In other words, <coughs> can the panel <coughs> tell me, for <coughs> instance, that a move towards <coughs> wind power will create jobs in rural Australia. The mm. absence of such detail seems only to invoke fear in voters unsure of their priorities. Okay, look, the, there's no doubt that our contribution to, to global emissions is small. Uh, it's about 1.5% of total global emissions. But our per capita emissions are very, very high. They're about the highest of any developed country. And relevantly, when you hear people in Australia 
talking about how the Chinese are emitting too much CO2. Remember, they're about five times as high as China's on a per capita basis. So when you actually go to these climate change meetings, as I have done as representative of Australia, um, you know, our arguments about we're only small really cut no ice at all with, the, uh, with other nations. In fact, they're regarded as risible. Um, in terms of um, the, the justification for an ETS is simply that it is the most cost-effective way of reaching, of cutting your emissions. That's the argument for it. Now, you might disagree with that. You might think you can do better by regulation. You might think you can do better by a carbon tax where you, where you fix the price and hope that the quantum of emissions will, will be where you want it to be, as opposed to cap and trade where you fix the quantum and then the market determines the price. So it's two different approaches, but they both put a price on carbon. The thing that is important to bear in mind, and this is, this is really the single most important point I'd like everyone to go away with tonight remembering. There is no such thing as a free lunch in terms of cutting your emissions. One of the greatest lies that was ever told was, it's easy being green. You know, you can do it all, it won't cost you anything, right? It is not true. The fact is that moving, we have a cheap and abundant fossil fuel sources in Australia to move to a lower emission economy is going to cost us money. It will cost money. Now, how much more money is a big question, but it will cost more. The coalition's policy, for example, has a cost. It will not put up electricity prices but it will deploy billions of dollars of your taxes to buy carbon offsets, mostly from farmers, which will not send any price signal to the energy sector or industry at all, but will, as they emit more, the taxpayer will spend more dollars buying more offsets so that in net terms the target can be reached. Arithmetically, mathematically, you can get to the, outcome, the net outcome you want, but there is always a cost. So the argument for an ETS, I'd say to, to William, is in fact a very conservative one. Liberals, people who believe in the free market, should support market-based mechanisms. Uh, that's certainly what we did when John Howard was Prime Minister. The, the, the argument for it is that it's the most, it's the route to least cost abatement. That's the argument for it. It's not, a, as you said, uh, Ian, it's not a goal or an end in itself. Matthew, do you want to come we all fork out money for insurance premiums every year for things that are highly unlikely to occur, for car and travel and, and life insurance, and the list goes on. And the cost that Malcolm's referring to is very real, and I'm not denying there's, a, there's no cost there, but mm. it is a fraction of what we fork out for insurance premiums, and these are unlikely events. Climate yeah. change unchecked is certain to change the planet in dangerous and costly ways. Yeah. And I, that, I, I, I agree with that. Now, what I do with climate change is interview thousands of scientists in completely different climate-related fields. Some of them are measuring bird migration, others lumps of ice, others soil. The variety is astounding. And as I once said when I was on television with Nikki after a film called The Great Global Warming Swindle, it's a bit like, just to mix the metaphor, going into a room where there's been a murder and you get 50 or 100 completely different bits of forensic evidence, all, all pointing to the same direction that the butler did it. And so, the question to Matthew, how long can Tony Abbott keep denying climate change? <laughs> um, I was thinking this might come my way, and I was actually going through a few different answers, and I realised, just as you were posing the question, that the answer is he cannot do this any longer. Um, he apparently said that the climate science is absolute crap. And this is a quote that we've often heard, and I don't know whether who was in the room when he said it, but that was his position as reported on Four Corners at least um, some many months ago. Um, but he now, I believe, is not saying that, and so I think that this is recognition from Mr Abbott that you, you cannot be credible and deny science that is about 150 years old. The first measurements of greenhouse gases <coughs> and their capacity to trap heat were, were made um, by John Tyndall, a famous UK physicist, 150 years ago. So this science is old. Al Gore did not invent climate change. And <laughs> the time has come that it's a political or liability, I think, to actually <laughs> pretend that it's not a real problem. Ian. Yeah, I think um, 
That's actually not the sort of denial that most worries me. Yeah, there's some people, okay, for whatever reason, they're not going to believe the climate science and uh, the more evidence there is, that just sort of seems to harden their position. But I think for the challenge we face, there's another form of denial which is actually more problematic. And that's a denial of the scale of the challenge that we face. So if you accept climate change is a problem and think that a 5% target in 2020 is the answer, you are effectively in denial about what really has to be achieved. I'm just going to jump to a question uh, from Hugh in Paddington. How are we ever going to solve this problem if things are as serious as people like James Henson says? We're running out of time, but we seem to have endless conferences, talks, and now two elections, but no action. How can we remove the barriers, and can solar and wind really provide baseload? Now, I'm going to put this to Malcolm because on Thursday, you were at a conference at the Town Hall where zero emissions, Matthew Wright from Melbourne, whose rather different take on this matches to some extent Mark Diesendorf's from this university saying that zero emissions can provide, and they're saying something like 100% in 10 years. Sorry, yeah, 100% in 10 years was in fact the message. Were you impressed, Malcolm, by the... Yeah, look, I, I, I think the... Let, let's cut right to the chase here. The, the, the problem with most renewables um, is, and when I say most, I'm really, I'm really talking about wind and solar. In fact, I'm only talking about wind and solar. The problem with wind and solar is that they are inter intermittent sources of energy. It doesn't, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. Now, you can get around a lot of that with a smart grid. If you've got a big country and a smart grid, it, the wind will be blowing somewhere. Uh, and I guess, you know, if, you, if you've got a big enough and smart enough grid, the sun will always be shining somewhere. But the, one of the problems is how do we store electricity? Um, some people have used pump storage. In Scotland, for example, they've used wind power to pump water back up into a dam and then run it down the dam, you know, through a, a, a turbine uh, to generate electricity when they want it, when the wind's not blowing. Um, however, th this issue of storage is, is really a big one. And again, when I was your environment minister, I spent quite a lot of your taxes on funding uh, primary research into uh, storage technologies. I think the most promising technology, however, is the one that's the, 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 really the, the guts of this zero emissions uh, study from, by the people from Melbourne, uh, which is um, concentrated solar thermal, which is pretty simple, really. It involves using a field of mirrors to focus the sun's rays on a heat exchanger through which is run molten salt, which um, is heated to in excess of 500 degrees Celsius, it is then run through another heat exchanger to make steam, which then drives a conventional turbine such as you'd have in a power station. The good thing about the molten salt is that it is jolly hot and you can store it in effectively a large, very large thermos flask, if you think about it, and it will continue to generate heat when the sun isn't shining, you know, such as at night. Now, that technology is actually far more proven than clean coal because there are plants operating using that, and there is now, uh, both in Spain and um, the United States, and there is now a, a planning approval given for a very, very big installation. I can't recall the exact, uh, you know, giga gigawattage or megawattage of it, but it is big, very big, industrial scale, uh, using exactly that technology. Now, if that, is if that becomes really viable and deployable and people get smarter at it and so it becomes cheaper to deploy, that will be a very, very significant technological advance. Donna, if you want to um, a couple, mm, Over a decade now, I met David Mills, who's a fabulous physicist at the University of Sydney. And I don't know how many of you have heard of him. Um, it won't be a surprise for you possibly to know he's no longer in Australia. The reason he's no longer in Australia is because he gave up after a couple of decades of trying to persuade the federal government to accept his solar thermal technology, which could make baseload power, not just to power Sydney or New South Wales, but Australia. He was so frustrated with that situation, he gave up, went to California, and joined with Vinod Kloster, who is the um, co-chair of... Just in case it's breaking news. 
No, no. <laughs> no it's a passage from Hard Times. <laughs> Brilliant, isn't it? It's possibly slightly too long to read, but uh, yeah, yeah, the first you can give half, a reference. Half of it, maybe. Yeah, give the reference. Why do you think? Well, like just that? oh, just a, you, you know, we were all bedevilled with complaints whenever you get uh, talk about carbon taxes or ETSs or regulations. Every industry says they're going to be ruined if uh, something <laughs> isn't done about it. And um, uh, the Grattan Institute did a very good paper the other day about some of the economics of these relevant industries, and I'd commend you all, commend it to you. But they um, quoted a passage from Dickens' Hard Times, in eight, published in 1853, talking about the owners of the mills in these, this fictional, grimy, industrial town, Coke Town. I'll just read the first paragraph. And he says, Surely there never was such fragile chinaware as that of which the millers of Coke Town were made. They were ruined when they were required to send labouring children to school. They were ruined when inspectors were appointed to look into their works. They were ruined when such inspectors considered it doubtful whether they were quite justified in chopping people up with their machinery. And they were utterly undone when it was hinted that perhaps they need not always make quite so much smoke. So special pleading from industries been with us forever. There's nothing like history, is there? Mm. Ian, and then we'll go to the audience. We've got Dante. Sorry, um, I was just actually finishing my story about Sorry. solar thermal, <laughs> which is <laughs> now in California. So some Californian companies are actually making the money. Then it got bought up by the French nuclear industry. So it's just one story of many Australians that have had to go overseas because of federal government policy inaction, which really frustrates me because it is much easier for our smart minds to go overseas. The sun god, Dr. Xi, who was at this university, is now a billionaire in China. He was here. He wanted to work here. He can't work here. I could go on, but obviously I'm going to get cut off by federal politicians. So I'll stop now, but if you want to right, find going, out more, read my book. Yeah. Keep going. Oh, well done. I just wanted to come back to Hugh's question about this issue of delay. And uh, if we want to understand the barriers, uh, well, let's see who benefits from delay, right? And it's certainly not David Mills, because he's trying to do something new. Uh, delay is effectively a victory for incumbents and the vested interests that Malcolm raised before. They don't have to win this. They just have to delay us doing anything and uh, things go well. So when you're trying to think about barriers to this, Pretty quickly we arrive at this issue of the incumbents and the role that they're playing in delaying action. Uh, that's somewhere which we really have to address. Thank you. Oh, we've got about 20 minutes for questions, and please. Uh, my question, which I did submit in writing in advance, must have been one of the ones that uh, Robin put his little red or purple or pink line through. There were 85 of them. <laughs> one of the 75, then. Um, uh, concerns something of the fact that we have uh, six white faces on the panel and not one black one, and it, it concerns the uh, nuclear waste from Lucas Heights, which to me is a contribution to the global warming and its proposal to dump it at Muckatee. And I was asking Malcolm and any other politicians on the panel why the two major parties support uh, the terra nullius view that. Aboriginals out there near Tennant Creek can have all the white fellas nuclear waste dumped on them because they are, after all, black fellas, and this country is, as far as the white fellas are concerned, still terra nullius. No nuclear dump at Muckety, please, Labor or Liberal. Comment? Well, look, I, I just, I just, leaving aside the the uh, sort of white fella, black fella part of your. Uh, uh, question. I honestly don't agree with you that uh, storing nuclear waste is, uh, if done, you know, properly, is, uh, is is something that is beyond us. I mean, uh, nuclear power generates around 20% of the world's electricity now. We have some of the most stable geology in the world. Uh, we have the technologies to store uh, nuclear waste. Uh, and as uh, Ziggy Switkowski, uh, you know, demonstrated, I think, in that really excellent report he did for the previous government, uh, you know, the, if, you, if the nuclear waste is contained properly, Sinrock is obviously an option, very obvious option, 
uh, and you know, stored in appropriate geological uh, environment, uh, it's something that is uh, very, very manageable. And you know, I just have to say that the, I, I don't think the, con the, the scientific contention you're making is, is, is a good one, with respect. Donna. Donna. I'll, I'll just be very brief. Um, I just heard storing waste if done properly. The US has had a lot more experience in nuclear than we have. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, they're not using Yucca Mountain as their storage site after billions of dollars of research money has gone into trying to make it work. What's the point? How much money do we need to spend in Australia to do something that's very contentious and not really good social policy to be doing something like this when we just don't need to? The cake's still in the bin. When does the cake come out of the bin? Robin, Robin, can I... Robin, just whilst you go to that question over there, I'll just quick keep talking during the white space that's occurring. Um, I've got colleagues at MIT who look at the mix of energy required and backing up what Donna's saying, m their, their strong view is that nuclear is not needed in this mix. I know that's not shared by everybody, but I, I've heard this from experts at MIT who look at the power supplies we have at our disposal. Um, a question for Dr. Williams. Um, you're here tonight as a uh, representative of the Australian resource industry. Can you categorically deny that um, resource companies in Australia are not fi pro providing finance to peddlers of misinformation and climate denialists? And if you can't uh, deny that through lack of information, could you go away tomorrow and start a dialogue with all those in, uh, industrial firms and get them to agree to stopping such practices? Well, certainly in terms of the mining industry that, uh, that I represent and in terms of New South Wales and the mining industry that I'm aware of uh, in Australia, um, there isn't any such sort of um, peddling into or financing of... Uh, conspiracies or, or, or attempts to, to uh, subvert the course of justice. Um, in terms of the... the, the there are uh, sceptics and there are those who, um, who have strong views that, that uh, oppose climate science. They are not regarded as uh, credible within uh, the mining industry that I represent. And um, I don't think uh, there's much point in a dialogue with the... Uh, the sceptics. Uh, sceptics seem to be, um, you know, they're true believers and uh, it doesn't seem to matter what sort of science is put in front of them, uh, there's, uh, there's always an argument around it. I think sceptics uh, uh, jump on the fact, and Malcolm referred to, I think it was Malcolm referred to this uh, earlier on, that there is uncertainty about um, the timing of impacts and the magnitude of impacts and things of that type. And, and because there's uncertainty in the science around those things, sceptics use that uh, as an excuse for inaction. Um, but as Matthew uh, quite rightly uh, pointed out, uh, there are uh, incontrovertible uh, scientific truths uh, and that, that is a requirement for action. And in terms of the mining industry, that is where we are positioned. That is where we, we are putting our money where our mouth is. There is no other mining industry in the world that is funding scientific research uh, where we're trying to, to commercialise, to, to, to Malcolm's point, to actually deploy technologies to get them to commercial scale so that you can actually make the economics work. There is no other industry in the world but in Australia that is doing that. So um, I just, I, I, I don't know that there's anything else I can add. Let me just pick add. up a point uh, from the question. Have you come across a book by Naomi Oreskes and one other from the University of California, which documents in great detail, in fact there was a two-page review in the journal Nature three weeks ago, the ways in which some parts of the energy industry, especially in America, have been funding advertisers in the same way as the tobacco industry was funded, to have messages which have been saturating many parts of the media, and indeed, as you say, promoting some of the people who are feeding the most purple kind of denial. Some of the evidence she marshals is overwhelming. I actually broadcast some of the stuff that she talked about in the science show at Easter. Have you, anyone on the panel come across now, Mira? Yeah, but, I, but I just want to make the point, though, I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that perhaps doesn't happen, but I'm saying it's not happening in the Australian industry, and that's all I can speak sure. for.
Uh, Robin, can I just, just in the defence of, of Nikki's industry, uh, it, it, it's important to bear in mind that the mining industry in Australia is not, um, you know, our great big source of greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, the, that yes, they use energy, you know, electricity and diesel and so forth in, in mining operations, but th there are no mining operations that are high emission industries other than a number of coal mines where there are very high, which are very gassy mines, which have a high level of uh, what are called fugitive emissions. You know, but the, you know, the iron ore industry, for example, uh, would not be rendered uneconomic by a carbon tax at all. You know, it's, uh, there, is, there, there are also emissions uh, associated with some of the LNG um, uh, you know, uh, operations because some of the, the gas bodies have a lot of carbon dioxide in them. But overall, you know, the reason we are a high emission per capita country is because we generate 85% or thereabouts of our electricity by burning coal. You know, and a lot, a lot of that is brown coal. So, you know, that, that's why, you know, cutting through the, the, the static, that's why we're a high emission economy. So stationary energy is really the key target here. Um, uh, there was just been reference to the incontroversial truth of the science. Now, I think I might have the answer to one of the major problems whereby the a significant portion of Australian public don't believe you. Now, the reason I think they don't believe you is because you don't go out and explain it to people. I've actually sought, uh, I, I actually run lectures for Engineers Australia, and I've invited Professor Matthew England to come along and explain his position. We had one talk from a skeptic, we had one talk from somebody else, and we were going to have a talk from Professor Matthew England and some of his colleagues and you won't come out and explain your position. So therefore, uh, in Australia, there's been no real debate. So I fully understand people saying, well, if they're too frightened to debate and explain their positions, we don't believe them. Thanks for the question. Uh, as Julia Gillard often said during her Q&A last week with Tony Jones, good question, I'm glad you asked. That allows me to raise an issue here. I mean, we, we uh, do get invited to give presentations very often, I think if I answered yes to every single one, I would actually be presenting every night of my working life every year. And this just goes to show you the scale of, of um, appetite there is for the science and for understanding the science. So I appreciate the need there. But one thing I would say about your specific invitation was that this format of a debate of pitting a Ian Plymer or William Kinnanmoth or Bob Carter on one stage of the on one side of the stage and myself, Randy Pittman, Dave Caroli, on the other side, even if it's separated by a week between the two events, is still, or a month, or a year, it's still a complete misrepresentation of the, issue, of the, de of the debate that's existing. Um, you're basically cherry-picking uh, a very tiny fraction of actually non-climate experts to present their views, which have no credibility in the, in the practicing area of, of climate science. And you, and you're pitting that person up against somebody who represents the science as a whole. Now, th there's been analyses of this by psychologists, and I was at an event that Malcolm Turnbull uh, hosted actually a year ago or so to debate Ian Plymer. At the end of this, I think it was uh, the former Liberal leader, uh, Debnam, who got up and asked the audience, hands up who, in the audience, who believed Ian Plymer before this debate occurred, who now believe Matthew England, and not a single hand was raised. And then he said, hands up who believe Matthew England before this debate started, who are ne who's now convinced by Ian Plymer's argument, and again, not a single hand was raised. These debates are absolutely futile, and I'm very happy to speak to any organisation about the facts of climate change, but uh, I've given about six debates versus the sceptics, and they get nowhere. Uh, I'd like to return to actually the last of the tabled questions, um, which was how well, it was a two part question on how we can remove the barriers, and the second part of the question was about renewable energies uh, playing a contribution. And the answers tended to focus more on the renewable energy technology side of things. Um, but we, you know, that, that's surely one part of it. But the other part is finding a, a, a proper bridge 
between um, the constraints that people like the minerals industry face in this country uh, and what the politicians do. And Ian also suggested, you know, there are certain incumbent interests who have a certain interest in seeing policy fail. Um, it strikes me from having looked briefly at the CPRS debate that what was emerging before um, the CPRS failed in the Senate was, was not something that was really going to um, remove barriers to the sort of scale of action uh, that was required as demanded by the climate science. So I wonder if I can press the panel a little bit more on how to get to grips with some of these um, divides between um, uh, on the political and policy side and the economics of climate change rather than necessarily just focusing uh, on the technology side of things. How do you get it to work? Don, no? Well, very briefly, um, I would like to say something that might surprise some people who know me. Um, I would support the coalition policy on climate impacts that they said they wanted to cut emissions by 20% by 2000, which was back in 1989. It actually had bipartisan support. So we have had the will in Australia to actually make serious mm. cuts a while ago. My concern is that we've gone so far back, we've got to go so far forward just to get to where we were. So it's possible we can do this. I don't know how we make them do this this time. It seems to be, this is a, a scary new world for me. Um, I'd love to mal vote for Malcolm Turnbull, who's um, <coughs> my local member, but I can't see how he can reconcile what he knows to be true about climate science and the level of policy that's <coughs> needed to take on the problem with his party's views at the moment. And unfortunately, they weren't, they weren't always like that. We need to remind people of stuff that was 20 years ago. That's not too long ago. We need to get back to that fast and then move forward. Malcolm. Well, can I just, just, I think the key words that Donna uttered there were party's views at the moment. I mean, political parties' views change all the time. Sadly, leaders change all the time. Um, the, um, the, so the fact is that if you, if you want to have, you know, you're asking me a blunt question a couple of days before an election, a good reason for voting for me, there may be some others, a good reason to voting for me is to have somebody in the Liberal Party who is known to be committed to taking effective action on climate change. Uh, because if there is nobody there, or there are fewer people there with that view, then there is a lesser prospect of getting the action that you desire. C can I just deal with the arguments that we have to address? This, the first one, you know, so let's say people say we don't want to have an, we don't want to put a price on carbon. Okay, one argument is climate change is, is rubbish. It's not true. Well, I won't dilate on that. We've discussed that. Another argument is to say, yep, I absolutely believe in climate change science. I think it's absolutely right. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. But why should we go first? Why should we do something when other people are not doing anything? And this is the prisoner's dilemma problem that that uh, Ross Garno talked about at length and, and Nick, Nick and Lord Stern talked about. And, you know, the argument there is, and the view that we came to when we were in government, with, when I was the minister and John Howard was prime minister, uh, the view that we took was that we should, we, firstly, we're not going first. There's, you know, we are so far behind the rest of the pack, it's not funny, so that's number one. But there, but there is a, we have a vested national interest in starting to move down that trajectory of cutting our emissions. And we do that recognising that the rate of cuts is going to be dictated in part by global action, but also understanding that because we are a developed and wealthy country, and because our emissions per capita are so high, if we do not take action, it is very difficult to persuade others, particularly in the developing world, to take action themselves. So plainly, it's, it's, a question, it's a question of degree, and there's an element of perhaps nuance in this, but it seemed back in 2007, under the leadership of that well-known environmentalist and greenie John Winston Howard, it seemed then that it was obvious that it was in our national interest to start, taking, start cutting our emissions, and I think it still is. And the extraordinary thing is, I think the public still thinks it is, I think the business community thinks it still is, uh, but we have reached a, um, you know, a political situation where, you know, somebody, um, you know, perhaps somebody who doesn't live in Wentworth anyway, who wants to vote for 
effective action on climate change is going to struggle uh, finding candidates that are really committed to it. It'll all change on August the 22nd, won't it? Uh, Robin, could, could I... Yes, you can, and uh, then I've got someone who's gripping Ian Plymer's book very, very lovingly. <laughs> Please, Nikki, quickly. Um, how you get over this question about the, um, the need to establish the carbon price is, is absolutely um, essential. And, I mean, there's something appealing about what, uh, what Malcolm was saying about having people uh, in the political parties and in a position of influence uh, to ensure that the degeneration into politics and actually the elevation to policy um, sort of c comes, comes back. But we clearly need that, that, that price signal. Once you have a price signal, though, you have to recognise that the Australian economy is very much an export economy. So if you look at the emission trading schemes that operate uh, in other parts of the world, and the EU was the first and, and most well known, what those schemes uh, did were have phases uh, going through to 2020 and, uh, and beyond, where they were gradually increasing the number <coughs> of sectors that were covered by their emissions trading scheme, um, uh, initially only carbon dioxide as opposed to what we've proposed here, which was all six uh, Kyoto Protocol uh, greenhouse gases. So there, I think we have to be clear about how we transition uh, our economy and how we maintain that international competitiveness with those economies uh, that do not uh, a, a apply a price signal to uh, the production of their goods and services. So you're starting off smaller and, and, and moving through that regulatory maze. But most importantly, perhaps, is, is actually big picture, consistent, bipartisan policy around the frameworks that are needed to change our economy whether that's to power generators, we need a price on carbon because no one's going to build a new generation um, power, power plant, whatever t type of technology it, they're using, unless they know that that investment is secure. So those policy frameworks are important, and that's where the federal government has an important role in terms of bringing the states with them. So you don't have competing schemes operating all around Australia. You have one scheme, one goal and one target. And I just want to say, though, the 5% target that, 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 uh, that, the, that the, the, the parties have agreed to, a 5% reduction, I should say, by 2020, because of our increasing population, that will mean that uh, an effective uh, reduction of one third of our per capita uh, uh, energy consumption or our, our emissions. So it's not just a 5% cut, it's actually a, a, a significantly more substantial cut. In amount of 15, yeah. Yeah. So that's, we'll have to that's move on ambitious. Time. Two quick questions. Hor horribly quickly, except that if we had the CPRS in, we actually don't have to cut our emissions at all by 5% because we can buy international offsets. We're going the wrong way. Business wants certainty. They want the signal Nikki's talking about. Why the hell don't we just get on with it? Thank you, Donna. Yeah, you're right. And you know, the Thibaut Mongar, Sydney University. Um, I'm not a skeptic, I'm just really genuinely confused by the science. And the source of my confusion seems to be the scale on which you look at the climate change problem. You look on the short term, in 250 years, yes, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has gone from 200 to 380 parts per million. You look on the scale of millions of years, and uh, the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is at record lows. It used to be in the thousands of parts per million by volume. Uh, to illustrate this, I'd like to quote just two sentences from Ian Plymer's book, uh, because I'd like you to comment on this. It's from page 180, and I don't know how controversial it is. There's no reference. It says, at present, each year, 186 billion tonnes of CO2 enter the atmosphere from all sources, of which 3.3% comes from human activities. More than 100 billion tonnes is given off by the oceans, and 71 billion tonnes is exhaled by animals, including humans. So if it's true, and I don't know if it is, perhaps Matthew can comment, and we are really talking about the 3.3%, then are we really just fiddling around the edges and have we got a bigger problem and have we got a runaway population problem rather than a runaway greenhouse problem? Um, it's hard to know where to start. <laughs> uh, Ian Enting, a professor at University of Melbourne, went through Ian Plymer's book. I don't know how he had the patience for this, and he identified literally hundreds of factual errors such as 
volcanoes emitting in one burp more than humanity in all of our developed time. These statements are simply untrue. Uh, the graph I showed before of emissions, they were from human activity. I didn't show anything to do with um, ocean sources or sinks and so on. And the human activity that we have in any year actually is way more than any single volcanic eruption. And, uh, you know, I mean, basically all I can say is that Ian, Ian Plummer's book should be on the fiction shelves. I know that's disparaging and it, for anybody who supports his views, I sound like an arrogant, inconsiderate bastard. But the fact is, credible scientists have pulled apart his book. It is littered with errors and, and fabrications of data. Robin's interviewed many people about this book. Um, the issue is, there is very clear certainty, as Malcolm and others have said tonight, on certain issues. The radiative properties of greenhouse gases, the fact they're increasing, the fact our planet's warming, the fact we, we need to reduce emissions at a, at a grand scale. Those sorts of things are absolutely certain. Uh, the uncertainty can work both ways. Again, as Malcolm said beautifully, uh, uncertainty can mean that the warming we reach is much higher than we predict. It may be at the low end, but no action spells climate change that is far more costly than doing something about it. Thank you. And one of the reviews of the book by Implymer was actually done by Malcolm Walter, who's here tonight, and he said much the same thing. Final question, because we're way over. Uh, just a quick question to the panel um, in relation to the Greens' position in not supporting the ALP to getting the ETS through the Senate uh, early in the year, I think. Um, they ended up getting uh, nothing where they could have got something. Now, one of the uh, explanations that was put to me why they did that was the 5% target was not enough. Um, if And that once legislated, it's hard to turn about that legislation or, or alter that legislation. I'd just like the panel's opinion on how difficult once, that, uh, once you've actually established the ETS in legislation, how, how easy is it to change that? Um, and in which case, were the Greens right or, or should they have supported that even without Mr Turnbull's uh, support when the leadership changed? <coughs> well, the Ralph Nader effect, I think it's called, how holding out for perfection, but not in this millennium. Mm. Can we do an answer that? that well, I think there are two uh, great aphorisms that come to mind there. One is, you should never allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And the other one is a bit tougher on the Greens, and that is that there are none so pure as the impotent. The, the Greens' um, position was a purely political one. It was thoroughly cynical. They ended up with nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Uh, and that's what, that's what they ended up with. As to the imperfections, real or perceived, in the emissions trading scheme, look, every scheme like that is going to involve a lot of compromises, particularly with industries and, you know, who is a, you know, I quoted that passage from Dickens, I mean, these arguments about the effect of changes in regulation and environmental rules on industries are, as, you know, as old as industry itself. However, the, think of an emissions trading scheme as like a thermostat. You may, you, you, what you've got the thermostat, you've got your, you know, your air conditioning or your heating, or whatever it is, and you've got the thermostat. The temperature mightn't be right to begin with, but you can adjust it. The great virtue of setting in place all of that machinery for, for, for registering, for trading, for recording uh, emissions is, and, and with, and albeit with transitional arrangements to protect, you know, strongly affected industries you've at least got a mechanism that, in the light of, you know, stronger scientific uh, evidence, if you need that, uh, or at least, and in the light, hopefully, of, of stronger international action, you can then ratchet it up, or perhaps if everybody decide, you know, if the sceptics approve right, you can ratchet it down, okay? But you've got something to work with. It, it's, it was a set of tools. That, uh, I described it once as a, as a, as a bit of economic plumbing. The problem is that thanks to the Greens, and there are other players as well, of course, uh, we don't have anything to work with now. We do not have any tools. And really, those people that are concerned, and I imagine all of us here are, with real effective action on climate change, should be very disappointed with the Greens. They scored a political point and sold out the climate in the process. <laughs>
Donna and then Ian, and then we're going to have to wrap it up, right? Donna first? I'll be quick, Ian. Um, I want to take a slightly different track. And I think I'm going to agree with the um, Institute of Engineers guy here. If you've got a problem, do you use the simplest solution? The cleanest, most effective, easiest to implement. You don't use a complex, convoluted 820-page policy document which actually covers such a, a rat's nest of caveats and sidesteps that it wouldn't actually end up reducing pollution. The CPRS was so riddled with difficulties and complexities, you probably don't understand it. It was a hard job for me to try and get my way through it about banking borrowing, ceilings on a $40 a tonne tax, when you would get windows for five years advance warning on things, and the most profound thing, the biggest polluters getting their 95% pollu their of their permits for free. This doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Is that why your book is called Screw Light Bulbs? Um, no, that relates to something that Malcolm said, so. Um, a different topic. But yeah, I mean, I would have loved to have supported the ETS if it was actually going to do its job, but it just wasn't. So I agree about the thermostat analogy, but if the thermostat's actually just broken, it's not going to go up or down when you move the switch. That's why I'm suggesting a carbon tax is really the way to go. It's clean, it's effective, we can get it in tomorrow, and it can actually work with an ETS if we need to link to an international system sometime later. I just want to make a, I just want to make one technical point. Uh, the, the the things that Don is concerned about, which are the you know the special accommodations made for what are called emissions intensive trade exposed industries, point, industries that Nicola talked about, you know that are you know price takers, not uh, and, and therefore can be prejudiced by a, a Australia having a, t a price on carbon when their competitors don't. Uh, those issues arise with a carbon tax as well, Donna. So, so you would have all the same arguments about, you know, aluminium, steel making, you know, et cetera, uh, with a carbon tax. So none of that would change. The argument for a carbon tax is very clear. It's simpler. You say, what is the price per carbon? It's 25 bucks, full stop. The problem with it is that you don't get the benefits of trade and you also don't know what your level of emissions will be, because you don't know whether $25 might, be, might drive too little a cut in emissions, or potentially, depending on economic activity, might drive too high a cut in emissions and actually cut your emissions faster than you want to or need to. So, so look, both, there are powerful arguments for both, but don't imagine, really, that the complexity associated with an ETS and all of the arrangements for emissions intensive trade exposed industries would be any different with a carbon tax. They would not. They'd be exactly the same. Ian. Yeah. Uh, firstly, uh, it, I took the message from the, the question and also from Malcolm's answer that the Greens did actually have an opportunity to pass this legislation. And uh, that's not clear to me. I, oh, no, they did. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, to clarify on that, the. Uh, well, there are two the, Liberals that crossed the floor. If the Greens had voted with it, it would have passed. I, I guess the question is whether they would have crossed the floor if that changed the outcome of the vote. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, there was a bill and it was, uh, the Labor Party voted for it. There were two Liberals that crossed the floor to vote for it. And if the Greens had voted with the Labor Party and those two Liberals, Senators Boyce and Troth, it would have passed. No, my question is, would they have crossed the floor if they understood that the Greens were going to vote in favour of oh, it? Oh, definitely. And absolutely. It would have... Oh, absolutely. Of course they would have, yeah. No, they were, they were, they were seeking to get the bill passed. Okay. There we are. <laughs> uh, but I'll make... I just want to make one more point yeah. on the emissions trading scheme. And it comes to Nikki's point, actually, about this idea of investment certainty. When we create this market, uh, part of what we're creating is a, effectively a property right for people in this market, a sort of government guarantee that this market is sort of serious and uh, that your view on what it's going to deliver has you know, a, a reasonable time horizon on it. Now, the scheme is designed, looked very much designed to set a fairly modest price uh, with a whole lot of issues about how much action would have happened in Australia or overseas, uh, a point that Donna made before. So in some ways, the challenge is you can provide investment certainty with one of these schemes, but maybe for the wrong sort of investment. And the challenge, of course, if you're going to provide investment certainty, you want to make sure that certainty is for doing the things that actually put us on the trajectory that I think we all agree for 
de completely decarbonising our electricity industry in 40 years. So for me, I think that was the real challenge around the emissions trading scheme design. Thank you all. And may I introduce someone who's full of certainty, and that's the Dean of Engineering, to give a vote of thanks, <clears throat> Graham Davis. Uh, thank you, Richard, and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's great that this is a joint production between engineering and, and science, we think, because I think it's reflected in the, in the work that we're doing, where science is identifying the issues for us, and engineering is coming up with the major solutions. I hope to be able to solve some of these problems. Uh, it's also a, a fact that in our new Centre for Energy Research and Policy Analysis here at the University, this is one of the major issues that we have to deal with. And it's not just about the technologies, as we've heard tonight. It's really about the technologies, how they feed together into the electric grid, and then how the economics and the policy analysis on the top of that brings the whole together in a holistic fashion. And I think that's really important, and that's the way we see that this research should be undertaken. Now, it's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to our distinguished panel this evening. And I think we'd all agree it's been a very good debate, conducted in a very constructive manner. I think in the, uh, in the jargon of the day, we could definitely say that we're moving forward uh, in the topic of climate change and ETS. And to make sure that we're politically neutral, uh, I think we can claim to have seen some real action tonight. Though not as enough action as I think we'd all agree we'd, we'd like to see in the future. I don't think there's any real debate about the effects of climate change or the causes, and I think the panel has really articulated their views. We've also heard about the use of renewables and the way that they can reduce CO2 emissions. But as Malcolm has said, it's not just a simple solution there. Renewables uh, have to fit in with a mix of other technologies. And technologies such as carbon sequestration are also important in the medium term. Now we think about Australia in terms of carbon sequestration, where the source and the sink can be separated by quite large distances. But in other parts of the world, that's not a problem. So carbon sequestration can be a solution uh, in the medium term. And I'm thinking about uh, areas such as the North Sierra gas fields in the North Sea, where they're now exhausted of, uh, of the natural gas, but the pipelines are still there, so it can be used in reverse and CO2 can be pumped back down. I say it's not the solution in the long term, but it is and would get us through uh, part of the transition period. We know, as, uh, as Ian has said, that the electric grid of the future will be very different from the electric grid as we see it today. It'll have to be smart to handle the different power loads coming on at different times of the day from different fuels and ensuring that private generation of electricity can also be fed back into the grid. Now these smart grids will have to guarantee that feeding power in and out of the grid can happen safely without the whole network falling over. This is a huge challenge for future power engineers and one we don't fully understand as yet. And all of this has to happen against a backdrop of an ETS or something equivalent, where the costs of different fuels will have to be adjusted to give us the optimum mix of power output for minimum carbon production. So the smart grid will have to be even smarter than we first thought. As Malcolm indicated, we have to be aware that however we try to reduce carbon emissions, then there's going to be a price to be paid. Somewhere in the value chain, this cost will have to be absorbed, whether it's a tax, a credit system, or a subsidy to certain fuels to make sure that they're cost effective. Also, it's good to hear Malcolm pushing energy efficiencies, a, de a debate which is often let out, left out of the ETS question, and there was very little debate about uh, energy efficiencies this evening. And I'm always surprised that the nuclear debate isn't really a debate. It's all driven by emotion and very few facts. 
uh, and it was sad uh, that that didn't come across this evening either. Because from a carbon reduction point of view, this gives you the fastest return on investment. So to sum up, this evening we've covered, and the panel has covered a great deal of ground and aired most of the important topics relating to an ETS and its equivalent system. It's therefore my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to our panel, the Right Honourable Malcolm Turnbull MP, Dr Nikki Williams, Professor Matthew England, Dr Donna Green and Dr Ian McGill. Thank you very much. Very good. Well, I'll cut you and I'll cut you. And well done, brother.